So we're picking up right where we left off. And since there was a break right in the middle, let's remind ourselves of where that was. We were trying to solve systems of linear homogeneous differential equations with constant coefficients. Quite a mouthful. Um, but these are differential equations or systems of differential equations, I should say, that can be rewritten as x prime equals a times x where A is a square constant matrix. And we made the observation that such a system has solutions. Let's try that. V again has solutions V E to the lambda T, where V and lambda are an eigenvalue eigenvector pair. A V equals lambda V. So our goal when we're trying to solve a differential equation is to get a general solution. If A is N, where am I writing? If A is N by N, then to find a general solution, we need N solutions. So just with what we've done so far, with what we did before the break, we can solve some systems like this. Let's solve x1 prime equals 4, x1 plus 2x2, x2 prime equals 3x1 minus x2. And at some point, I might just start using technology to find the eigenvalues and the eigenvectors. But this I'll do by hand, or mostly by hand. Um, so this is x1, x2 prime equals the matrix 4, 2, 3, negative 1, times x1, x2. And we need to find the um, eigenvalues and eigenvectors. of this matrix A. And it can be a bit of a hassle, or if nothing else, it can get kind of repetitive by the time you've done this for like the 10th time. 
but we'll soldier on for the eigenvalues. We want to put negative lambdas down the diagonal and set the determinant equal to zero. So for the two by two case, the determinant isn't so bad. We multiply the diagonal elements. We multiply the anti-diagonal elements. We set this all equal to zero. And then whether this is easy to solve, whether it's hard to solve, it's all going to depend on how big the matrix was and what the specific values of the matrix were. Let's see, minus four lambda plus lambda you can usually tell when, um, when a problem is taken from a textbook because it's designed to work out nicely. Um, lambda minus five, lambda plus two. So our eigenvalues are five and negative two. And again, you should also be prepared to use the quadratic formula if you're given a problem where, where stuff doesn't factor. So each of these eigenvalues now turns into a separate problem because for each of these eigenvalues, we need an eigenvector. And let's see. So we want to solve A of V equals five V A minus five I times V equals zero. And what's a minus five i? Well, just as with a minus lambda i, we'll get minus fives on the diagonal and the rest of the matrix will be left alone. Four minus five is negative one, negative one minus five is negative six. We're setting this equal to zero. And we hit this with Gauss-Jordan elimination. And again, we're treating Gauss-Jordan elimination as a black box algorithm. You don't even to need to know the name, really. You need to know that in the calculator, it's RREF. We go to the matrix menu. We need to throw this matrix into the calculator. Negative one to zero. Three, negative six, zero. And it so always takes more button presses than it seems it should, but we get to RREF. We 
we hit this with the RREF algorithm. Always feel like I'm a seal when I say this out loud, uh, laughing, but we get one negative to zero, 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 zero. This is zero, 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 row is good. If we did not get a row like that, something's gone wrong. And we hopefully remember, or if not, we'll refresh our memory how to interpret this. So each of the columns corresponds to an entry in the vector, except for the last column, which corresponds to a quality. And the rows give you equations. V1 minus two V2 equals zero. And then I'll write it, but then erase it because it is not helpful. Zero equals zero. And there are an infinite number of ways we can make V1 minus two V2 be zero. but maybe two one is the easiest. Um, two minus two times one is indeed equal to zero. And this is going to give us a solution. It's going to give us two one e to the five t as a solution. And then we repeat this with the other um, the other eigenvalue. So we used five. We should repeat this with negative two. As I said, it does get get kind of repetitive after a while, but negative two. So we want a plus two i times v equals zero. Is this clear? A minus negative two, so that's why it's a plus two here. So again, the I means that the addition or the subtraction we do just happens on the diagonal. So four plus two is six, negative one plus two is one. Otherwise this matrix is left alone. And now we have to solve this. Or I guess I should say we have to row reduce this. And I'm just going to uh, say that if you plug this into your calculator and do the RREF, That's what you're going to get. Let's hasten this along a little. So 3v1 plus v2 equals zero. 
that comes from this first line. Three V one, one V two equals zero. And um, let's see. Let's make, I don't know, let's make V1 be one. That would make V2 be negative three. And again, we could let V1 be anything except for zero. Um, but you know, if we made V1 be a nine sevenths or something messy, that would, what would that give us? We like to try to make these eigenvectors nice if we can. And we get one negative three E to the negative two T. And now, this was two by two, so we needed two solutions to create the general solution. One, two, we're good. X equals C1, times two one e to the five t plus c two one negative three e to the negative two t. So is this clear to everyone? I mean, again, I know it was all kind of unfortunate timing with that week long break coming right in the middle of this material. Um, one thing you might observe is we had in our actual differential equation, we have x1 and x2. In our solution, x1 and x2 are not explicitly showing up, but they're hiding here. This vector x is x1, x2. And if you really wanted to, you could expand on the right. So this is 2C1, C1, E to the 5T, plus C2, negative three C2, e to the negative two T equals two C1, e to the five T plus C2, P to the negative 2t, C1, E to the 5t, minus 3C2, E to the negative 2t. So just so we're clear, I'm doing scalar multiplication here. This E is a scalar, so to do scalar multiplication, we multiply the scalar by both the entries of the vector. 
And then for two vectors to be equal, their components have to be equal. So x1 is 2c1 e to the 5t plus c2 e to the negative 2t. And x2 equals this. x2, c1, e to the 5t, minus 3, c2, e to the negative 2t. So, um, when we are solving systems of linear equations, we have to look at matrices and vectors, but we can go back to systems at the end of the problem if we want to. So let me make an observation. I think I probably made it last week or the week before last, but that was two weeks ago, so let me make it again. If A an N by N matrix has N real eigenvalues. then we're golden. Because each of the eigenvalues is going to have an eigenvector. With these eigenvalues and eigenvectors, we can create solutions. The solutions we create this way are automatically linearly independent. No need to mess around with the Rontzkian. And once we have n linearly independent solutions, we put the constants, the c's in front of them, and we add them together. And we get a general solution. <sighs> Sorry if I seem a little flat. They like saving. Just hit me like a brick here. Um, so what's that leave us? Well, we can have fewer than n eigenvalues unfortunately, or we can have complex eigenvalues. So let me make a few, a new statement. If A is N by N, and it has fewer than n eigenvalues, we still might be 
okay. So what can happen if you have fewer than n eigenvalues is that one eigenvalue can give you multiple linearly independent eigenvectors. And what we actually need in order to be golden, as it were, is n linearly independent eigenvectors. Having n different eigenvalues is nice because it means we definitely have independent eigenvectors. But we might have fewer than n eigenvalues and still be in a good situation. So let me do a quick example of this, a quick, because this topic has an entire section dedicated to it. Um, and this is kind of a goofy example, if we're being honest, but... Um, why do I call this example goofy? Well, because this is putatively a system, but there's no interaction between the variables. We could solve for x1, we could solve for x2. Um, However, let's view this as a system. X prime equals A times X. And we can go through the work, or you can do it as an exercise in your own time. But I am here to tell you that there's only one eigenvalue of A, and that is true. Let's try to find eigenvectors. And here's where things turn goofy. Because A minus 2i is 0. We wind up with that. And what's this tell us? Well, the first row tells us that 0 equals was zero. The second row also tells us that zero equals zero. And students sometimes see this and they think, oh, there aren't any eigenvectors because there's no eigenvector equation. Actually, the opposite is true. Any V1, V2 that makes this true is 
an eigenvector. But that's all of them. Um, zero equals zero is always a true statement. One zero is an eigenvector. And zero one is an eigenvector. And so, as a matter of fact, is literally every vector except the zero vector, because there's no vector we could pick that would make zero not equal to zero. And then these two eigenvectors are linearly independent. Um, neither of them is a constant multiple of the other. So we have two linearly independent eigenvectors. One zero e to the two t and zero one e to the two t are two linearly independent solutions. And we can use them. <sighs> to create a general solution. So even though we don't have as many eigenvalues as we might like, even though we have um, only one eigenvalue, we can still proceed because we have a sufficient number of eigenvectors. Um, and if this example, kind of looks like nothing to you. Um, as I say, we're going to do further examples um, of this on Thursday. So don't worry about it too much for now. Let's instead from on. and look at what happens when we have complex eigenvalues. And there's kind of a pedagogical problem here, which is that complex eigenvalues will give you complex eigenvectors, but your cultivator will not find complex eigenvectors for you. So when I do an example, I'm going to go to Wolfram Alpha and use that instead. Let me, what order do I want to do this in? Let's go general and then do a specific example. So if there are if you have a complex eigenvalue, you have two complex eigenvalues. Complex eigenvalues show up in what are called conjugate pairs. And a complex eigenvalue is going to give you a complex eigenvector. And those also show up in the conjugate pairs. So very similar to the last time we looked at this complex stuff, um, up to a point, everything is going to be exactly the same as it is in the real case. Let's pick 
just one of these complex eigenvalues to focus on. Let's look at P plus QI and A plus BI, its eigenvector. So up to a point, everything is identical to the real case. Um, we've got the eigenvector times E raised to the eigenvalue times T. And this is a solution. Now, just as happened when we were looking at um, individual equations, we don't want to have exponentiation of the imaginary unit I. Um, if nothing else, we probably don't have a lot of intuition about what e to the i looks like. So we'd like to get rid of that. Just as we did. Goodness. Really am tired today. Just as we did in the one equation case, we're going to use Euler's formula to rewrite this. So this A plus BI, we leave alone. We have an e to the p t there. And then we have a cosine of q t plus i times the sine of q t. And we're using the fact here again. We're using Euler's formula. E to the QI is the cosine of QI, or rather, E to the QI T is the cosine of QT. plus i times the sine of qt. Uh, and now we're going to do um, some not super exciting simplification. We are going to foil everything out and we are going to get our real terms together, and we're going to get our imaginary terms together. And what I mean by that, if, if you're not familiar with the complex numbers, um, some things here have the imaginary unit I attached to them, some things don't. The part that doesn't have I attached to it, we're going to call the real part. The part that does have I attached to it, we're going to call the imaginary part. When the smoke clears, oof, we get E to the P T times A, the cosine of QT minus B, the sine of QT plus, uh, I went down 
on my knees and everything, and I'm still running out of space, the imaginary unit times, let me get rid of that parenthesis, the imaginary unit times e to the p t times b, the cosine of q t plus a, the sine of q t. Yeah. So there's a solution. Um, and you might think, okay, we used one of these eigenvalues and one of those eigenvectors to get a solution. We want two solutions, so now we'll use the other eigenvalue and the other eigenvector to get a different solution. That does not turn out to be the case. In fact, we have two linearly independent solutions sitting here and facing us. It turns out that the real part of this is a solution and the imaginary part of this is a solution. And those solutions are linearly independent. So using one of these eigenvalues and one of the eigenvectors, we found both the linearly independent solutions we need. And we're done with this eigenvalue pair. Why are these both solutions, though? I mean, we found the whole, the entire solution. Why are these component part solutions? Um, that's a slightly intricate question, but sort of the, the five Second answer, I say, although it's going to take a little more than that, is we've got a solution on the complex plane. So if this solution is a solution on the entire complex plane, well, the real numbers are part of the complex plane, so it must be a solution on the real numbers. Well, on the real numbers, there is no imaginary part. So to have a solution on the real numbers, this part that I haven't scribbled out must be a solution by itself. Similarly, if this is going to be a solution on the entire complex plane, it has to be a solution on the imaginary part. Well, on the imaginary part, we don't have that. I mean, on the imaginary X, 
says, sorry, I'm fading, I'm very tired, but um, on the imaginary axis, there is no real part. So for this to be a solution on the imaginary axis, this purely imaginary thing has to be a solution. Or if, if that doesn't uh, sound very convincing to you, I'm afraid the only real alternative is trust me, I'm your professor and I wouldn't lie to you. Um, but one way or another, we really do get two linearly independent solutions. Let's... Let's look at an example. Four, negative three, three, four. And we can find the imagine, we can find the eigenvalue is just using the regular way. Four minus lambda, four minus lambda, three, negative three. This determinant equal to zero. Um, four minus lambda squared, plus nine equals zero. Four minus lambda squared is negative nine. What is, what is the square root of negative nine? Yes, or three times I. I, I can't, I'm not, even though we're using the complex numbers, I don't want to turn this into a complex analysis class. So I'm not talking about, you know, how to do a bunch of stuff with the imaginary numbers. One thing you should know is that the square root of a negative number is just the imaginary unit i times the square root of the positive number. So the square root of negative nine is i times the square root of nine is three times i. But just as always happens when we solve an equation like, uh, where did, what is this? Where did my pen go? Um, if I end the share and then bring it back, that should fix it. Now it says my screen sharing is paused. Um, somehow, in spite of using Zoom for years, I still sometimes find it inscrutable. There we go. So this is plus or minus the square root of negative i or the square root of negative nine. So that's plus or minus three i. And lambda ends up being four plus or minus three i. 
So we have an imaginary root um, or an imaginary eigenvector or uh, just a bunch of ors. I really should say a convex eigenvector. If you call a number imaginary, you're sort of suggesting that you just have this part and don't have the real part in front. So a complex number, um, your calculator, as I say, is not going to find eigenvectors for you, or at least I don't think it will. Right. Your calculator does have somewhere the imaginary unit I here, come that nope, not here. I was going to say your calculator has the imaginary unit I program somewhere in it. Maybe it just doesn't. Or at least I don't know where it is, if it does. Catalog. Okay, here it is, but, but even though your calculator has the imaginary unit I in it, I'm pretty sure it's going to give us an error message. Yeah, it does not want us to have a matrix with imaginary or convex parts. So our calculator's out. What I'm going to do is go to a website I might have gone to a few times already, wolframalpha.com, and I'm going to tell it four, negative three, three, four, so usually Wolfram Alpha is really good about not requiring any specific syntax. But for matrices, it kind of does. When you want to tell Wolfram Alpha you've got a matrix, you put the entire thing in the curl the brackets, then you put the row was in curl the brackets separated by commas. And I say, Wolfram Alpha, please find the eigenvalues for us. And it gives the eigenvalues that we found for plus or minus 3i. And then it gives the corresponding eigenvectors. So notice the subscript. Lambda 1 has V sub 1 as an eigenvector. Lambda 2 has V sub 2 as an eigenvector. So we're using addition. We're going to use 4 plus 3i. So our eigenvector is going to be I1. And notice that Wolfram Alpha gives us this complex eigenvector in a different form, but we can write this is um, I zero plus zero one. So zero one plus the imaginary unit 
of one zero. And then we plug and play. Um, it's kind of tedious. In the notes, I say that you shouldn't memorize this formula. You should just derive it every time. I'm not certain. I still believe that, but let's go through the process. So one zero times the imaginary unit I plus zero one times E to the four plus three i times t is <coughs> one zero times the imaginary unit i plus zero one times e to the 4t times the cosine of 3t plus i times the sine of 3t. And now we, um, Multiply this out. Um, so, slightly tedious to do. Why don't we start? This multiplication here distributes over that addition. There's our eigenvector, then e to the 4t times the cosine of 3t minus e, or rather plus e to the 4t i times the sine of 3t. And now when we multiply this out, we're going to FOIL, first down our inner last. We just have to be a little careful with that imaginary unit. So first, uh, no real comment. We've got one zero times e to the four t, times the cosine of 3t, and we've got the imaginary unit i. So the what part of foiling is this? The outer part. Here's where I told you to be careful. We have an i times an i. And I squared is negative one. So our eyes are going to go away. And turn into subtraction. Then we have the inner part of the foil. 
one, or rather zero one. Sorry about that. E to the 40 times the cosine of 3t. And then we have the last part of the foiling. Zero, one. E to the 4t times, let's put the i out front, times the sine of 3t. And now we're going to group our real stuff together, and we're going to group our imaginary stuff together. So our real terms, the terms without an imaginary unit are those. And we can pull an e to the 4t out. And we get to 0, 1 times the cosine of 3t minus 1, 0 times the sine of 3t. And this real part is one of the solutions that we're looking for. And then we can look at the imaginary part, the part of this that has the imaginary unit. We can pull that imaginary unit out. We can pull the e to the 4t out. And we get one zero times the cosine of three t plus zero one times the sine of three t. And this imaginary part is our second solution. Notice it's not great terminology. When we're talking about the imaginary part of a complex number, we're actually excluding the imaginary unit. So when I'm talking about the imaginary part, I actually don't care about the imaginary unit. I care about the stuff the imaginary unit is being multiplied by. Oof, these, uh, these problems always kind of turn into productions, I'm afraid, but we're basically done. I mean, the only thing we haven't done yet is actually write down the general solution. Again, we've got a two by two matrix. So we need two solutions to find the general solution, and we've got them. They're the things I've circled down here at the bottom of this frame. So the other eigenvalue, we don't worry about. So C1, E to the 4T, times zero, one, the cosine of three T. Hmm. 
minus one zero the sine of three t plus c two e to the four t One zero the cosine plus zero one the sine. And there's our general solution. Um, again, I should stress, because we're looking at these as two by two cases, we're kind, kind of treating them as if they're separate. But what if we had like a three by three matrix? And it had one real solution and then two complex solutions. The, the complex solutions being conjugate pairs. Well, you just go through these. Do you use the real solution? real eigenvalue, I should be saying, to find one of the solutions. You use the complex eigenvalue to find two or more solutions, just like we did here. And then we put them together, C1 times the real solution, plus C2 times the first complex solution, plus C3 times the next complex solution. All right, then we are uh, done for the day. I promise to be a little more bright-eyed in class Thursday.